my name is John Gillespie, and I'm the president of the Wine Market Council in the United States, which is a nonprofit association that conducts consumer research for the benefit of the wine industry. I'm also the founder and chief executive officer of Wine Opinions, which is a private market research company that does uh, both trade and consumer research for wine associations, uh, regions, wine marketers, and wine brands. At Wine Opinions, we've been doing uh, studies of U.S. wine drinkers and members of the U.S. wine trade regarding imported wines in 2008, repeated in 2010, and repeated again just this last summer. And there are a couple of things that I think are important to note. One is, and it's very positive for all imported wine companies, is there's an increasing outward-looking U.S. wine drinker that is interested, of course, in California wines and wines from Washington and Oregon and New York and other places, but increasingly more outwardly turned and more willing to experiment with and discover wines from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that sets the table in a positive way For sure. if you're a wine yeah. exporter. And, and these are younger people or these are... It, the, you know. the, the people with this sort of global mindset about wine skew towards the millennial generation, which is to say they're people generally in their mid-30s or, or under. Okay. So I think that's a very positive, that's a very positive thing if you're trying to sell important wine in the U.S. And, It's a combination of two things, and I think you've sort of named them both. One is that because of the cooperative financing that the European Union provides to both countries and regions, we see increasing amounts of promotional dollars, advertising, public relations, trade tastings, and the like, being spent in the United States, not just by Italy and the regions of Italy, but in Spain and Germany and, and, and France and Europe. And, and, and. So that's, that's, that's one part of it. But a second thing is that, and if you look especially at younger Americans, they have a mindset that they want the best and the coolest and the newest thing, yeah. and they don't really care where it's made. Okay. It doesn't matter to them whether their iPhone was made in China. It doesn't matter to them whether the sneakers that they wear that are great for cross training are made in Korea. It doesn't matter to them whether there's maybe a new dry white wine from uh, uh, Vino Verde in Portugal that they've never tried before and they and they like it. They're For much sure. more open. For sure. And so I think that's something, again, now the question becomes, how do you take advantage of that openness and that mindset for Italy or for Piedmont or for Tuscany or for... Yeah. You know, for a region, yeah, uh, and that's a challenge for marketers. Absolutely, but I think that the basics of the market are very positive for it. Now, having said that, the one trend that I will say that is a cautionary for Italy is when you ask people in the wine trade, retailers and restaurateurs and wholesalers and the like, what's on top of mind for red wines under twenty dollars? Yes, Italy isn't always first. Of course, not. Spain has gained. Very big, strong, and also new world wines new, as well, and new world, world wines as well. And so, Italy and the regions of Italy and producers, in my opinion, can never simply sit back and say, "We're very well established in the United no. States. Everyone knows us. Everyone loves us." Yes, but not everyone is standing still. Of course, not. wines from Spain are not standing still. Argentina is not standing still. New Zealand is not standing still. And so, and so. So you, you have to be mindful of that, and, and even though you're Italy, and I would say the same thing to people in France, mm -hmm. even though you're traditional and you're respected and you have a great market share, you can't afford to stand still. Our research looks at wine consumers who fit a certain profile. Mm -hmm. They have to be frequent wine drinkers because frequent wine drinkers buy 85% of the wine. Sure. We also have about 30% of our panel that are people who frequently buy wines costing over $20. Uh, and, and that's an important segment for a lot of Italian wine producers, a lot of wine producers everywhere. So what we're, what we're looking at is we're doing national online surveys of U.S. wine consumers 
who are pre-qualified to be the kinds of people who actually drive the market. So are educated, are educated in what they're actually drinking they're, to some extent. To some, they're, they're people who think of themselves yes. as being wine knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. They are much more involved with wine on many levels than just an average consumer. Mm -hmm. Their annual spending on wine is very high. Yes. And even if they're if they're buying bag in the box and inexpensive wines, but they're drinking those wines all the time, their annual spending can be quite significant. So it isn't just the person who's buying eighty dollar bottles of Barolo that's spending a lot of money on wine. Sure. Although those people are and we have a very good resource of reaching that kind of consumer for research. But you need really to look at high frequency wine consumers and people who spend a lot of money on wine. And that tells you where the market is it's really going. I think, I think there's maybe two or three things. Yeah. The first thing is the United States in the next three, four, five years will continue to be the number one priority market for wine producers around the globe. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of talk about China, and I'm sure there's some interesting things going on in China. But I know that there are 100 million wine drinkers in the United States, and that's more than the entire populations of most wine producing countries. So I know that the competition level in the United States is not going to go down, it's only going to go up. So people who want to invest in the U.S. have to understand that they're not the only ones and that they're going to have to earn their share. Okay. So, that's, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing is there's a continuing trend towards a greater consumption of red wine mm -hmm. in the U.S. Then white wine. Much less. White wine is fairly steady, but blush wines and rosé, except for the good dry rosé wines, is going down. So, so red wine is is the long-term trend in wine consumption is towards red wine. Look at the total consumption of, of, of wine, whether it's sparkling, red, white, blush, rosé in the U.S. Over a period of time, you see the red wine proportion going up and up and up and up. Okay. Recently, sparkling wines have gone up too, but from a much, much smaller base. Okay. Then the third thing I would say is that in two years, the youngest member of the millennial generation will be 21. And so we will have fully 77 million U.S. adults who are millennials. And we know from the behavior of millennials the last 10 years, the, the earlier ones, the older ones, that they're not only very drawn to wine, but they're very interested in imported wine because they drink 40% or 41% of the wine that they consume is imported compared to 25% for baby boomers. Yes. So, you, you cannot ignore that. So I think you take those three factors together and you have kind of the, the window of opportunity to build share of market okay. uh, for a brand or for a region or for a country. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you.